everybody, really intriguing, exciting chat about ultra low power wireless technology with embedded AI. Scott, how are you? Very good. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Well, thanks for being here. Um, I'm really intrigued by your story personally and the, the mission of, of, of you and the team. Maybe introduce yourself, uh, the company, starting from your groundbreaking PhD research uh, all those years ago yeah. uh, onwards. Yeah, thanks. So um, I am a founder and CTO at Ambic. Um, we are a company that's putting intelligence everywhere. So uh, what we have is we've got a unique extreme low power technology that that allows us to build really anything with with less energy so uh, in this case uh low power microprocessors um they consume anywhere from three times to 20 times less power than what's out there and so if if you're a company building a battery powered device you want to put intelligence in that device our our solutions are the ones for you um and it's a it's a technology based on um sub-threshold and near threshold circuits this is a um, it's actually a concept that's been around for decades. So if you go back to the 1970s, uh, subthreshold circuits were first theorized and, and early work was done in the wristwatch industry. But Ambic is the company that has, has built an entire platform uh, around that. So uh, we have a, a complete circuit design platform. We can build anything we want. Um, if you look at our portfolio of products today, we have uh, little wireless uh, chips that that that. Uh, are used in in consumer wearable devices. They're used in medical devices. They're used in smart credit cards, uh, industrial sensors, all sorts of things. Um, and it goes back, as you said, to um, PhD research that I was doing back at the University of Michigan. So I was a uh, um, uh, back in the in the late uh, two thousand six to seven eight time frame. I was a researcher doing. Uh, work primarily in um, uh, medical electronics and, and defense related uh, areas. And we were trying to build cubic millimeter computers. So think an entire computer in one cubic millimeter. You've got a battery, uh, a, um, a microprocessor, a radio, a sensor, all in one by one by one millimeter. And as you can expect, with a battery so small, the, the, the key constraint there is you've got to get the power that your system uses down such that it can fit in that in that tiny battery footprint. And so we got really good at building low power processors. Um, and I, back in 2010, I spun that company out of the University of Michigan and, and formed Ambic. And since then, Ambic has been focused on delivering the world's most energy efficient solutions for anybody looking to add intelligence uh, to their device. And we've shipped uh, north of 230 million units at this point. So, um, you know, my guess is if wow. you're walking down the street today, you're going to pass a lot of people wearing our technology on our wrist, uh, carrying it around in their pocket. Uh, uh, any number of other things. So we're we're definitely um, um, putting intelligence everywhere as as originally um, targeted. Well, that's amazing. And as one who was involved personally with the first uh, single chip Bluetooth radio twenty years ago, uh, it's amazing to see how far we've come. At that time, the idea of putting digital and RF on a single chip was CMOS yeah. was was a huge leap forward, of course, you've come several, many generations since then. And explain, you know, the unique aspect of your your technology, how it works, and why it's so important for not just low power, you call it super low power. Uh, I guess there's a yeah, t-shirt out yeah, there with yeah. that somewhere, but, but how did it work exactly? Okay, so we, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a, a unique technology called sub-threshold and near-threshold uh, uh, operation. Um, and as I said, it's a, it's a concept that's been around for a while. Um, basic idea is this in conventional chips in normal chip design, we represent digital ones and digital zeros with voltages, right? You, uh, a zero digital zero is zero volts. Digital one is some much higher voltage, maybe 1.2 volts or one volt or 0.8 volts. Energy in a system, though, is is consumed every time you're toggling between zero and one. And the, the higher that voltage, the more energy you're consuming. And it's voltage squared. So, right, as, as voltage goes up, we, we get energy um, going up quadratically. So if you can drop voltage down, there's big energy savings to be had, right? And the problem is that the transistor, the underlying switch in that in the in the circuit, needs a certain voltage to kind of turn up, fully turn on. In subthreshold and near-threshold circuits, we say, you know what, we're going to flip that on its head. We're not going to fully turn the transistor on. We're going to raise the voltage up just enough where it still acts a little bit like a transistor, but it's not fully on in the, in the conventional way. Wow. Um, 
And so we, we do that. We get a big savings. And, and the net, net result is you're kind of using noise to do to do computation. And it comes with a whole host of challenges, as you can imagine. It sounds simple, right? Drop the voltage, get energy savings. But it turns out that we're exponentially or near exponentially sensitive to a lot of things. So temperature variations, environmental temperature variations, we're exponentially sensitive to that. Uh, manufacturing variations. Um you know, you you look at the mo most advanced nodes these days, and there's a lot of variation. Two nominally identical transistors look very different when you when you look at them under a microscope. We're exponentially sensitive to that. We're exponentially sensitive to voltage fluctuations. So it's hard to design in this region. Your typical companies have avoided it, and we at Ambic have have built a whole technology platform that we call Spot Sub Threshold Power Optimized Technology to address that. And it's a whole host of things that we do. It's, it's, um, it's new library uh, design techniques. It's um, uh, proprietary architectures on the analog, digital, and memory. Um, it's production test and, and trim techniques. So there's a whole bunch of things that we do to make that possible. And over time, that's added up. And, and as I said earlier, we've now shipped several hundred million units of the, of the technology into all sorts of interesting applications. So it works. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a hard technology to master. It's one that we've spent years mastering. Um, and then now it's a, it's a platform that I can go build a lot of different things. So we, we today sell a whole host of microprocessors covering, covering a range of price points and feature points and performance points. Uh, and you can expect much more of that to come in the next few years. Amazing. Well, well done. And tell us about your Apollo processor. Uh, when you know my audience thinks processors, they're going to think you know ARM and and Intel and, and mm -hmm. Qualcomm. No small feat developing mm -hmm. a, a processor. So, what were some of the challenges, risks, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, and what was the big idea, mm -hmm. you, you know, with your own processor? Well, so we first of all, we are uh, these are um, ARM based processors that we that we build. I see. Um, we and and that's part of the beauty, right? Is is I um, I'm enabling my customer to use the thing they're familiar with. ARM use an ARM based microprocessor, but I'm doing so in a way that they magically get get energy savings, right? So our technology is such that I can apply it below the architecture level. So the software experience is the same as what they get elsewhere. Um, these are Cortex M class cores from ARM, so they're um, you know, they're microprocessors that run up to 250 megahertz. Um, the latest release, the Apollo 5 generation, um, is a Cortex M55. So it's a um, it's a, um, a a processor that is nice and lightweight. You run a, a real time operating system, uh, but then it has a, a little uh, vector compute unit. So the so called helium vector compute unit, so that you can you can do eight multiplies in a single cycle if you're running neural networks or if you're running uh, filters or, or signal processing operations. So it's a really versatile um, uh, little compute engine. Um, what's cool is we also have, uh, because Spot is so versatile, I can bring in all kinds of other um, IP. We have uh, a GPU on board. So a lot of our customers have big displays, rich displays, and they need to do it efficiently. Uh, well, we've got um, GPUs on board that allow us to run um, with, with uh, great efficiency. Um, all sorts of audio peripherals, um, tons of memory. So um, when I say tons of memory, I mean on the order of eight megabytes of of total memory for the big for the big microprocessors, the Intel's of the world. That's small, but for for your uh, uh, embedded world, that's a a, a whole um, a very large amount of memory for them to to exploit. And the you know the wild thing is our customers eat that up as quickly as as we can design it. Right? You've got um, you've got graphics that needs big frame buffers. You've got neural networks increasingly being used by our customers and and the memory needs of that are, are really uh, insatiable. So um, really interesting, um, really interesting products. I'd say what is what is challenging for us is just the, the breadth of customer requirements. Um, we serve, you know, I rattle off some of the markets that we served before, uh, consumer wearables, um, uh, medical devices, some of them wearables, some of them, you know, patches, all sorts of different things. Uh, we serve smart credit cards. We serve wireless sensors, uh, machine health monitors, uh, livestock trackers. All of these markets are slightly different. They have different price points. They have different memory points. They've got different peripherals that they need. Uh, and so, you know, offering a portfolio of products to meet all those uh, is is the challenge. And that's look, that's a good challenge to have. We're a small company, and to have customers kind of uh, clamoring for your product is a really good problem to have. Well, congratulations on that. And I think you even just recently won an award at Embedded World. So uh, that mm -hmm. must have been very gratifying, satisfying to see the recognition there. And speaking of customers, what does a typical engagement with an OEM look like? 
and you imagine these design cycles are quite long. How early do you start these days and any shortcuts or, or, or hacks to mm-hmm. kind of get started to get to market faster, which is the name of the game. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it depends from market to market. We have a lot of consumer electronics customers and it blows me away how quickly they can move. Um, mm. We have uh, consumer electronics customers in China, in, in the U S in Europe, and the speed at which they move is, is wild. So um, it's, you know, it can be as short as a six month engagement before they, before they start ramping to production. It can be as long as 18 months. Um, and, and what we try and do is accelerate that early development. Um, sometimes for alpha customers, for, for early engagements, what we'll do is we'll give them even an FPGA version of our chip to get them going, right? To, as we're designing the chip, here's an FPGA that models what this chip looks like and they can start porting their software. Um, but for a lot of other customers, uh, we'll give them, uh, you know, we'll give them access to the silicon. And, and um, at this point, you know, we've, we've helped so many customers port from other uh, competing products that it gets to be pretty straightforward. And as I said, we're using standard ARM, ARM cores. And so the software porting process is relatively straightforward. Um, you know, when we were a small, uh, early stage company, um, we had great hardware, but our, our software needed to catch up. It was difficult to use. The feedback from the customers was, hey, I love your hardware, super low power, but man, the, the software's got to come around. Well, in the last you know, five to eight years, let's say, we've made huge overhauls to the point where our software is extremely easy to use. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not just, uh, when, when I first started this company, a lot of what we provided to the customer was here's hardware and here's uh, um, some, some a low level board support package and, and hardware abstraction layer, customer go do everything else. Well, these days we're providing a complete solution, right? You go in there and you say, okay, here's a Bluetooth stack that runs your full connectivity stack. Here's a graphic stack that you can use to run uh, run your UI. Um, uh, here's a security stack, right? So we're providing end solutions. And the newest bit of that is we're providing a neural network stack. So we have a product that we call Neural Spot. And um, this is, um, you know, everybody's heard of TensorFlow. That's the training framework that Google provides so that you can go build your own neural networks. Well, down here is the Apollo processor. That's a uh, mm. that's you know bare metal. But there's this gap you have to fill, and that's what our Neural Spot product is. It's a it's the glue that that gets you from TensorFlow down to down to bare metal. And then what we also provide along with that is what we call AI development kits, and these are these are pre-trained models, neural network models that we have some in-house experts that create. They created them. We provide open source uh, uh, data and the model itself, the weights, everything you need to train your own model. And the idea is not that you would take that model pr- to production, but that you can use it to seed your own efforts. So you, you know, you're asking, how do we get these customers going and speed them along? Well, do a portion of the work for them and then let them mimic it. And right now, the hottest thing going is, is how do I get inference on my chip? How do I get neural networks on my chip? Uh, and so we have to give them the tools to do that. And, you know, we've, I would say that that seven or so years ago, when I started looking at neural networks, I was intimidated by it. It felt like this thing that you needed to have a PhD and years of experience to to take on. <laughs> um, but these days, that's not true. We we have a um, uh, an expert, uh, our VP of AI, uh, named Carlos Morales, and he's the one who showed me that hey, you know, this is all very uh, 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 something that, that is attainable, right? You you get yourself. Um, you don't need a, a cloud's worth of compute. You get yourself a good um, gaming PC on the desktop. You can train models. You can build your own neural network models. Um, you can you can you know copy or, or not copy, but you can uh, emulate the the um, neural network models that are being published weekly in in various papers. Uh, and you know go build and experiment yourself and, and iterate. So we've been building a lot of models internally, um, and we're trying to show our customers that hey, you too can can um, develop these. So. A um, lot of amazing tools out there. Uh, some of some of which we're developing in house. Some of which we're we're getting from partners. But um, these days, it's getting a lot easier both to develop, you know, all all the graphics and connectivity software, but also the the neural networks that I just mentioned. Wow, that that's so exciting! Particularly when you see all the open source models and tiny ML, everything's playing right in your yeah. house. Maybe talk about your and the the team you built, the the growth trajectory you're on. Where are folks located? Uh, what's been the secret sauce mm-hmm. to the culture and the and the, uh, yeah, the co-working yeah. environment you have there? So we're um, I'm located in in, in Austin, Texas. Um, 
And that's where we were basically founded, spun out of University of Michigan, moved here and, and built the core team here. But over time, we've become a multinational company. So we're a roughly 200 person yeah. company. Um, uh, I'm going to say roughly half of that is in the US. And then the other half is, is split between strategic sites in uh, Europe, um, Singapore, China and Taiwan. So uh, in Japan. So very much a multinational company uh, doing technical development, both here in the US as well as elsewhere. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a number of tenets of the culture that we're that we've built here. But one of those is, is innovation. Uh, and, and another one uh, involves putting the customer first. So I think what you'll find at Ambic is a company that's built around where we're, we're going to innovate, we're going to be aggressive, we're going to you know, put out new products that are lower power every year. Um, but we're doing so in service of the customer. Um, and uh, hey, every business is is serving customers, right, in some way. But I think um, we really put that at the forefront here. And and our customers would say the thing we like about Ambic is that yes, they they offer low power, but we also know that Ambic's going to bend over backwards for us. So um, I think we've been really nimble and, and agile for on on behalf of our customers, and I'm proud of that. So. Um, uh, the, the team is, uh, obviously we, we have a big chip design, um, presence here at Ambic, but increasingly, as I was just alluding to earlier, software is a big piece of what we develop. So between mm -hmm. our, our software and solutions team, which is, uh, um, you know, developing all kinds of, of, of enabling software as well as our AI team. Um, I'd say there's probably more people at Ambic today writing software than there are, uh, building hardware, which I think is pretty typical of a chip company these days. Indeed, probably the same at your big OEM customers. And, you know, maybe talk a little bit about the semiconductor space. You, you probably as excited as as many of us are to see the renewed focus on chips and silicon and semiconductor manufacturing, even in your neck of the woods, your backyard. Um, what, what's the opportunity there for, for you, but also for the industry, uh, do you think? So, um you know, this one's been a long time coming for me. Um, everybody who's, uh, this is the only company I've ever worked for. Okay. Ambic is, is my company and that's the only company I ever want to work for. Um, but when I talk to all the, 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 um, experts we've got on our team, what they see is there's, there's, you know, cyclical nature of this industry. We go up, we go down. Um, but when I first founded the company, we were certainly in a trough. It was very hard to, to, to build a new chip company. Everybody wanted to invest in software, um, but we saw vision of, of, of hardware becoming important, especially as intelligence. There was this IoT thing that was being theorized, right, when I first started the company. And I had to explain to investors and VCs, what is this Internet of Things? Um, well, it's, it's being fully realized now. And I think everyone's realizing, especially when you look at the data center and look at the, um, the um, proliferation of AI, that, oh, my gosh, hardware is actually uh, quite important. Clearly, it's at the center of, of geopolitics these days, too. Um, and we found ourselves um, very much at the center of that, right? So um, uh, China remains an important market for us. Um, Taiwan is an important manufacturing site for us. And so um, we, we pay close attention to all that. So I think, um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that hardware has become important. Um, um, I'm, um, let's say, uh, very closely tracking all the geopolitical uh, interest in the semiconductor space and in the hardware space. Um, and I'm pleased to see that that various governments all over the world are are really investing in that. I think that benefits us. It benefits uh, everyone else in the space. So um, it's it's been an interesting few years for sure. Uh, and I think you know the companies that are doing well and thriving are the ones that have have stayed nimble. And that's um, you know back to the values of the company. One of the values certainly is that Ambic has to stay innovative, but also nimble. And and that means keeping up with uh, uh, the, the changing geopolitics around around semiconductors and hardware. Such a fascinating area to watch. Um, let's talk a little bit about sustainability. It's, low power is not just a, a nice to have these days. It's a must have yeah. from devices right through to the data center. Everyone talks about the compute, the power requirements of AI. Uh, challenging, to say the least, this is. It must be rewarding mm -hmm. to be involved in that sustainability discussion. Uh, and it's important for many industries, healthcare and wearables and other things. Um, what do you, how do you think about sustainability? Uh, yeah, from a um, chip manufacturing standpoint. Energy, energy is at the center of of everything. And you know, I started. It was it was clear that energy was important for battery powered devices. But um, what's become very clear lately is that it's 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 just as important, if not more important, for the data center. To your point, right? Um, mm -hmm. Everywhere we look, um, there's this need to, to cram as much compute as possible into a fixed power budget. Um, for me, for me, it's a battery that's inside this watch. 
um, for the data center, um, there's only so much power that nuclear power plant can deliver to the to the data center, right? So we need to get as much compute as possible in there. Um, and then there's this there's this other thing too, which has become obvious, is that all the devices that we've enabled over the past few years are generating phenomenal amounts of data. And the inclination, I think, for a lot of the vendors is, well, let's just send it up to the cloud and we'll do the we'll do the compute there, right? So. Um, you know, my watch has two choices. It can either take all my raw heart rate data and, and the microphone data and and and, um, and motion data and send it up to the cloud, or it can it can do the compute locally. And if you go do the analysis, it's just completely unsustainable to send it to the cloud. I, I have no hope of of uh, uh, powering all that. Right? If every if every smart device in the world um, uh, for every person was being was sending data to the cloud, it would just be a completely unsustainable thing. Right? So um, we're really in, we're really focused on how do we do that compute locally, um, and so I think that is an important sustainability play. We need to, we we don't have room to build uh, you know a nuclear power plant after nuclear power plant uh, to to supply energy to all these data centers, and so um, the I, we view the the edge devices, the endpoint devices, as kind of the front line in that in that um, barrage of data, right? And so we have to do our best to sort through it. Um, we get asked a lot uh, by shareholders, by customers, by partners, um, hey, where does AI reside? Is it, should it be in the cloud or should it be at the edge? You can make a good argument for, for either. And, and the fact is that both make sense, right? You have to, these, these have to be the eyes and the ears um, and the noses, so to speak, of the, of the, of the data center uh, counterparts. Um, but they have to do some work. They have to parse through the, the, this, this wave of data that's coming and only send up the, the salient points to the cloud for further consideration. So, um, yeah, I, I, it is certainly satisfying to be, to be part of that. Um, and um, we're doing our best to make sure that, that the, the stream of data that's flowing from these devices to the cloud is actually very minimal. It's more of a trickle, I think. Well said. Uh, how do you think about your innovation and roadmap the long term, maybe uh, five years out, are you thinking about areas like six G, for example, or is is you know you need to, you need to look closer to home? Uh, are, the, are these five yeah. plus year standards a little too far uh, out of range for you? Um, so I'm well. First of all, I'm really excited about where we can go in the next um, five yeah. years. Uh, as as technologists, I was just giving a. a seminar to some of our internal team yesterday. And what I said is, hey, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of what we've accomplished, but there's a big gap between what we've accomplished and what's possible. And we've got to start working on, mm -hmm. on closing that gap. Um, so what's ahead for us? Um, well, for one thing, Moore's Law is is alive and well in the embedded space. So we're, we're building processors today that I'm really proud of, 250 megahertz. These are in 22 nanometer technologies. Um, but look, the bleeding edge for the data center for phones is down at, you know, four and three nanometers going to two nanometers. Mm -hmm. There's a big gap there. And, and you know, there's a reason that embedded computing like, like our chips lags behind. Um, but we have a lot of room for Moore's Law. We, we partner closely with TSMC, our, our manufacturer, to, to make sure that we can jump to these new nodes. So that alone is giving us um, huge performance uh, um uh, benefits. So you'll see products from us coming that are are um, really really high performance. Okay, as we as we scale to these more advanced nodes. The other thing that's exciting is our, as as the workloads for our used by our customers are increasingly becoming AI. They're becoming neural networks. Um, that is a very parallelizable workload. It's the kind of workload that really benefits from from new architectural innovation. So instead of I said earlier that um, Apollo five can do eight compute operations in a single cycle. Well, what if we could do 256 or 1,024 mm. uh, 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 Mac operations in a single cycle, right? That that means you can run at a relatively low speed and get enormous performance. So you combine that with going to advanced nodes. And what I foresee is that the amount of compute that you're going to be able to put inside of a tiny little battery powered device like this is going to be phenomenal. It's going to be unimaginable. And wow. so what can, what can we do with that, right? That's the question. And and um, we've got some AI experts at Ambic who are there every week. They're tracking all the new, the latest publications. And what we see is um, these models keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, but what we also see is that the models that are that are tuned for the edge are getting more and more capable. And so I'm my objective here is to enable our customers to put as as big of a model as they can possibly conceive of inside of these little battery powered footprints. And um, mm -hmm. it's when we do the you know, the back of, back of the envelope math on, on what should be possible, it's going to be amazing. We're going to see 
certainly true natural language processing on endpoint devices like this, meaning I'm going to be able to talk to all my electronic devices as if as if it's you I'm talking to and, and not, um, you know, a thing that understands only the Alexa keyword or something like that. Um, and and we're also going to see the introduction of, of camera as a sensor in a lot of these devices. So problem with cameras is they they there's a, a, a mountain of data that those things produce with every frame, right? Every high definition frame comes along and it's a ton of data. Um, but we have products coming that are going to be able to handle that mountain of data quite well. So um, in the next five years, um, you know, actually the, the best sense of what's coming in the future is to look backwards. Uh, as I said, I was giving a seminar to my team last night. I compared the latest Apollo 5 processor to our original Apollo processor that was launched about nine years ago. And there is there was a 10x increase in performance over that time in terms of what a microprocessor can do. And that was accompanied by anywhere from a 5x to a 20x improvement in energy efficiency. So extrapolate that forward, it's going to be amazing what we can pack into uh, um, pack into tiny little batteries. So I'm excited about what's coming. Yeah, well, I'm certainly intrigued and excited by your uh your vision of where we're headed is so amazing. One last thought here before I let you go. Any advice to aspiring technologists, entrepreneurs, maybe out of or in academia moment? What was uh, that journey you and any advice you could give to them? Yeah, there's there's two things. Um, there's there's two bits of advice that I always give to entrepreneurs. One is if you're coming out of the university, take advantage of the the resources there. Um, the minute you take money from an outside funding source, um, there are consequences to your action, right? And and actions, and so you have to. You have to suddenly you have shareholders, you have uh, other stakeholders that that are, and and you're on a clock. When you're at a university, you've got access to incredible resources. You've got an office of tech transfer. You've got a lab. You've got professors. Take advantage of that. So if you're coming out of the university, don't be in a hurry to leave the university. The other thing I always say is, um, I, I'd say the difference between a successful entrepreneur and one who who is unsuccessful is usually not the idea. It's not it's not your technology. It's not the idea that you had. It's how persistent you were. Are you willing to to break through every last brick wall um, that's placed in front of you? And that's one thing that that we've been good at at Ambic. Look. There's so much that we can't control. In my since I founded the company, um, we faced uh, COVID. We faced um, all kinds of interesting geopolitical tensions between between um, uh, countries. Um, we've seen capacity shortages in the industry. We've seen over inventory problems at, at customers. These are all things I can't control, right? And so, as an entrepreneur, what you have to do is you have to you have to navigate all that stuff effectively, and 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 that is is usually more important than how great your idea is or or um, uh, uh, you know how exciting your first market is. Well, such an important sentiment. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for sharing the vision and the mission. Uh, we're all watching, many of us rooting for you, and can't wait to see uh, the next big leaps. All right, thank you, Evan. Really appreciate the time. Thanks, Scott. Likewise. Okay. Take care. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thanks for sharing.